The fourth video in this chapter analyzes the OMPC performance index. Background then on OMPC. What we've shown is that if we use dual mode predictions based around the implementation of an LQR regulator with some transient perturbations on the input, then we get prediction equations that look a bit like this. We'll notice that for the first NC steps, you have what's called maybe a transient mode where you have the LQR feedback and then some perturbation CK. And then after the first NC steps, you resort back to just the LQR feedback. So that's a standard format for a dual mode prediction. And if we choose K to the LQR regulator, this is called optimal MPC. What we're going to do is optimize predictive performance with respect to the perturbations in the transient mode. That's these terms here, C. But obviously, we'll only ever implement the first value. Therefore, what we're trying to do is minimize our performance index. There it is, set over an infinite horizon with respect to these perturbations in the transient mode, CK. Now, the previous video went through the algebra for computing this performance index and its dependence upon those perturbations. So if we take our performance index over the infinite horizon, there it is uh, x transpose qx plus u transpose ru, terms added up over an infinite horizon. Then what we can show is substituting our predictions, this j reduces to this form here. You'll notice there's a quadratic term in x, there's a term that depends on x and c, and there's a quadratic term in the C. Now the matrices can be defined from this algebra here, which I'm not going to go through again, where the S is given by this matrix here. And in particular, you'll notice the thing that we need down at the bottom here, this psi matrix is given up here. Now that's in the previous video, so I'm not going to dwell on it here. The key thing is that these matrices are well-defined and easy to compute. What are the aims then? What we want to do here is investigate the role and structure of each of these matrices in the performance index, so the SX, SXC and SC, because if we understand what these look like and what role they play, that insight could be useful. And we'll do this by beginning with a few numerical examples to set the scene and our expectations. So what we're going to do in particular is just calculate these matrices that are in the performance index for a number of different examples. And we're going to change NC, I'm going to change Q, I'm going to change R, and see how these affect these matrices. We'll start with two simple examples. So you'll see video 44 example 1 and video 44 example 2. So if we go to MATLAB, there's a MATLAB window. Here's the other MATLAB window. So first of all, you'll see this 4.4 example 1. You'll notice I've defined a simple single input, single output model. There it is. And then what I'm going to do, if I run this code down so you can see what's going on, is you'll see I've done a number of different horizons. So I've calculated the SX matrix for NC equals 1, for NC equals 2, and for NC equals 3. And then what I'm going to do is print out all the SX matrices for these different horizons, print out all the corresponding SC matrices, and also the SXC matrices. So if I run all of those lines, so you can see what's going on, then what you'll notice, first of all, this bit here shows you all the SX matrices. And what you'll notice is they're all the same. The first two columns, that's SX1. The second two columns, SX2, that's with NC equals 2. And the last two columns, SX3, that's with NC equals 3. And you'll notice, as I change NC, the SX matrices do not change. What about these SC matrices? With NC equals 1, I've just got a 1 by 1. With NC equals 2, you'll see I've got a 2 by 2. But interestingly, you'll notice that these two terms are the same. We seem to have a diagonal matrix with the same element in each diagonal. If I go to NC equals 3, again, I get the same value in a diagonal matrix. So that's an interesting observation. And finally, if I look at the SXC terms, the most important thing to notice is this value here, 10 to the minus 15. In other words, these matrices are essentially zero. Now, 
let's look at example two. So this is the same sort of thing, it's just a different um, set of state space matrices and you'll see I'll do a number of different horizons and put the results at the end. So if I run that file, there we go, going backwards this time because it's easier, again you'll see the SXC matrices down here at the bottom have got this 10 to the minus 14, essentially they are zero. If you look at the SC matrix, this one's got NC equals 5, you'll see it's got a 10, a 10, you see it's got again a diagonal structure and every element in the diagonal is the same. If I go to NC equals 2, same value in the diagonal. NC equals 1, same value. And again if I look at the SX terms you can see for NC equals 1, NC equals 2, NC equals 3, I get the same SX. So some interesting observations there. What have we noticed then? The value of SX does not change with the control horizon NC. The values in NC also do not change with the control horizon in NC. In essence, we found that SC is a diagonal matrix with the same values in the diagonal. And we also found that SXC is always zero. When we changed Q and R, we got the same pattern, although obviously the underlying values changed. Now in the second example, I'm going to take a MIMO example just to see did we get similar insights or something slightly different. So this is in example three. So if I go across here and find example three, there it is, get our command window so we can see what's going on. So you'll see with example three, it's now a multivariable example. Again, we've got horizon one, n equals one, horizon two, n equals two, horizon three, n equals five, and the final one with SX4, what we're doing is we're changing the weights. If you go across, you'll notice we've put some slightly different weights into the program. And at the bottom, we're generating all the matrices. So if I run that file, and let's see what happens. So again, if we look at the SXC terms, which is what we've got at the bottom here, what do you notice? 10 to the minus 13, in essence, all the SXC terms seem to be zero. If we look at the SC matrices, then what do you notice? Here the structure is a bit more involved. This is a two by two example. And what do you notice? There's a two by two block at the top here. And then the same two by two block in the bottom corner. So now we seem to have a block diagonal structure with zeros in the off diagonals, but again, the same structure. If I look at NC equals four, let's go up here. And maybe if I make this window a bit wider, we'll um, see more, oh, we won't see it now. Okay, so you'll see there's a block here, there it is, and then if you go to the next diagonal, you'll see we've got the same block in the next diagonal, and then down here, the same block in the next diagonal, the same block in the next diagonal. So we seem to have a block diagonal structure with the same block repeating itself. Here's for NC equals two, and again you see there's the block, and here's a block. So the same block repeating itself in their diagonal. And finally, if you look at, look at the SX terms, what do you notice? For NC equals 1, there's your SX, and this is the same as you get for NC equals 2, and the same as you get for NC equals 5. But the final one, we change the weights. So clearly, if you change Q and R, the SX matrix changes. So some conclusions. The value of SX does not change with the control horizon. The values in SC do not change with the control horizon. And SXC is always zero. So those are the things that we've observed. So let's try and understand these observations. We've got this performance index here with three terms. And we've noticed very particular patterns for each of these matrices. And what we want to understand is, are these observations obvious? And if so, can they be proved? Irrespective of the horizon NC, what we noticed is the future values CK are zero. And in this case, the cost is fixed. So what we're saying is if you choose CK equal to zero, then obviously the future predictions have got a fixed value. They cannot change. What does this tell you? Well, if you set all the future values of CK equal to zero, you're crossing that term 
and you're crossing that term and therefore the performance index is given by this term and clearly that cannot depend upon NC. So it's not surprising that SX is the same whatever you choose NC to be. However, just as an important observation, clearly this SX term has no impact on the optimization as it doesn't depend on the degrees of freedom, so that's not particularly important anyway. Second observation. You recall that by definition, and that's quite important, the optimal behavior is given by U equals minus KX because that was the optimal LQR feedback. And therefore, by definition, the optimal CK must be zero. The performance index is quadratic in terms of these perturbation terms, but the optimal is known to be the origin. So what I can do is I can rearrange my J. Originally I had it written like this, but what I can do is I can do a bit of algebra and I can rewrite it like this one at the bottom. So I've got a C future minus alpha times S times C future minus alpha. Now if I do that, because I know the optimal C is at the origin, I can show therefore alpha must be equal to zero because this is a quadratic, um, if the optimum is zero, alpha must be zero. Now, next thing I can do is I can expand out this term here and it gives me something like this. Now why I'm doing that is because I have got a relationship between alpha and SXC and there's the relationship there. But I know that alpha equals zero and because I know that alpha equals zero Essentially, that tells me that SXC must also be zero. The final observation. The final parameter is SC, and that's the most important one, which appears to have a block diagonal structure with the same blocks. So in other words, what we've observed is that SC has this structure. We have an X up here, and then we have an X again, and then another X, and so on. But these Xs obviously have the dimensions of the system input-output. Now this implies that in fact this particular part of the performance index could be broken down into each individual component. So I could write CK transpose X CK plus CK plus 1 transpose X CK plus 1 plus CK plus 2 transpose X CK plus 2 and so on. So each perturbation has an identical impact on the performance index. And the other thing is you'll notice there are no cross terms. So there's no terms which involve CK plus I and CK plus J where I is not equal to J. And you might be thinking, is that what I expect? That there's no interrelationship between these different perturbation terms. Let's have a look at the rationale. Now we know that U equals minus KX is the unconstrained optimal. And what this means is that irrespective of the value of CK, then the optimum value of CK plus 1 has still got to be 0 and therefore it has no dependence on CK and therefore there can be no cross terms i.e. there can be no off diagonals in this matrix SC because if there were off diagonals that would indicate that there were some cross terms. Secondly, we deploy infinite horizons and therefore the impact on the cost of a perturbation at time k or a perturbation at time k plus 1 must be, and this is key, must be identical. And consequently, all the diagonal terms have to be the same. So that's what we get. The observation SC is block diagonal with identical diagonal elements is exactly what we expected from video 2, where we basically said u equals minus kx is the unconstrained optimal. So for completeness, it's worth doing the optimization of J to determine the optimum value of the perturbation terms CK. So if I take my performance index again, there it is with my three terms. If I minimize with respect to these perturbation terms and then set that to zero, essentially sign doing the grad, then I get this relationship here. And of course, that tells me this, that the future value of SC Oh, sorry, of C future is given by minus SC inverse into SXC transpose times XK. Now, obviously, we know that SXC equals zero, so that tells me that the future values of C are zero, which we knew already. Now, the optimal unconstrained control law, U equals minus KX plus C, is therefore independent 
of the control horizon in C because I'm always getting C equals zero. So if I change the control horizon, it makes no difference to my unconstrained control law, which again is what I expect because I'm based around the optimal. So in summary, we've used argument and numerical example to investigate the structure of an OMPC performance index. And we've shown it's given by these three terms, a bit that turns on just x, a bit that depends on x and c, and a bit that depends on the quadratic in c. We've shown that the sx value is independent of the horizon. Uh, but of course, this term doesn't affect any optimization anyway, because it's just the initial condition. sxc must be zero. And this assumes that the predictions and the cost are both based around the same LQR optimal. And SC must be block diagonal with each block the same. Now here's a key thing. We're reminded that although this means the optimal C equals zero, so in other words you're saying we've done all this work and all this algebra, but why have we done it? Because we appear to have done absolutely nothing. We've added a perturbation, which is zero. What's the point? Well, the point is that this is important groundwork that we're going to need when we start introducing constraint handling. And constraint handling is the main reason that people use predictive control in practice.